um, <clears throat> welcome to lecture 9 and this lecture will be focusing on glycolysis we turn a new leaf in this lecture with, as we start with the metabolic pathways and therefore i will request you to go through the earlier lecture slides on the basic concepts that will be required in order to grasp the concepts of glycolysis in this particular lecture we will follow the following roadmap we will look at the key features of glycolysis i like to divide glycolysis in two phases and we will look at the general attributes of the two phases then we will talk about the regulation of the pathway and Towards the end of the lecture, we will focus on the need for the generation for lactic acid. And lastly, we will talk about the regulation of glycolysis in brief. Now, you have already studied the structure of glucose in organic chemistry. Just to recap, Glucose is an aldose, that means it has a functional aldehyde group and it is also containing six carbons, so it is an hexose. So if I want to summarize glucose, it's an aldohexose. Inside our body, glucose is generated from the breakdown of carbohydrates mainly and glucose is then metabolized via different pathways. If we have excess glucose, then glucose will be converted to glycogen and stored. And remember that the main storage form of glucose in animals as well as the human body is glycogen. Whereas in case of plants, the major storage form of glucose is starch. So glucose is converted to glycogen when we have an excess of glucose and there is no need for the production of energy in the form of ATP. So I, if I have an excess of ATP, then glucose will be converted to glycogen. If I require to generate ATP, that means if I have low levels of ATP, I will require to generate ATP and in such a situation, what will happen is glucose will be metabolized to pyruvate. And the process by which glucose is converted to pyruvate is an oxidation process and the process of the metabolic pathway is designated as glycolysis. In certain cases, we need to generate five carbon sugars. Then glucose acts as the precursor molecule and is converted to five carbon sugars such as ribose 5-phosphate, which act as the backbone for the formation of ribonucleic acid or deoxyribonucleic acid and the pathway by which glucose is converted to these five carbon sugars is known as the pentose phosphate pathway also known as the hexose monophosphate pathway or the HMP shunt or the hexose monophosphate shunt. Now when we talk about glucose getting metabolized to pyruvate by glycolysis, in books we have two conditions. One where oxygen is present and that particular condition is known as aerobic condition. Aerobic meaning in the presence of oxygen. In that case glucose is converted to pyruvate and then pyruvate is metabolized 
into carbon dioxide and water. In the process, it generates high energy electron carriers and these high energy electron carriers are then used for the synthesis of ATP by the process of electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation. However, if a cell is mostly involved in anaerobic respiration, that means oxygen is absent, then glucose will be oxidized to pyruvate. However, in this situation, pyruvate will not be converted to carbon dioxide and water, but will be converted to lactic acid. So, I can say that glycolysis is a common pathway for both aerobic and anaerobic metabolism of glucose. Now, for each metabolic pathway that we will be looking at in the course of biochemistry, we need to know the site of the pathway. That means in the cell, where does the pathway occur? So glycolysis occurs in the cytosol of all cells. And by now, since you have taken the lectures on cytology by Dr. Nerissa, you already know what cytosol is. Now, as I mentioned in the previous slide, glycolysis is unique in the sense that it can function either aerobically, that means in the presence of oxygen, or anaerobically, or in the absence of oxygen. And this, therefore, is dependent on the availability of oxygen and the electron transport chain. Under aerobic conditions, pyruvate will be metabolized to carbon dioxide and water, generating high energy electron carriers, which will further generate ATP by the electron transport chain. However, under anaerobic conditions when oxygen is absent, glucose is converted to pyruvate, but pyruvate is then metabolized to lactic acid. In the process of conversion of pyruvate to lactic acid, we do not generate any ATP. For your information, the red blood cells or the erythrocytes which lack mitochondria metabolize glucose by glycolysis. In RBCs, in the mature human erythrocytes, we do not have mitochondria. Therefore, aerobic metabolism of glucose is absent. Also, what you need to remember is that glycolysis can oxidize glucose only to pyruvate. So if somebody asks you what is the end form or the end product of glycolysis, the answer is pyruvate. If the person asks you what is the end product of glycolysis under aerobic conditions, you need to say carbon dioxide and water with the concomitant generation of high energy electron carriers. If you are asked the question, what is the anaerobic product of glucose metabolism? The answer is glucose will be converted to pyruvate, which will then be metabolized to lactic acid under anaerobic conditions. If I want to oxidize glucose beyond pyruvate, Aerobically, I require both oxygen and the mitochondrial enzyme systems. And this particularly focuses on the activity of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which we will deal in detail when we talk about the PCA cycle or the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. Further, in the citric acid cycle, pyruvate is metabolized to carbon dioxide and water. In the process, high energy electron carriers are generated, which 
via the respiratory chain, also known as the electron transport chain, lead to the generation of ATP. So these concepts of anaerobic and aerobic metabolism of glucose should be clear before you start looking into the different steps of glycolysis. This is a more elaborative figure on glucose metabolism. So let us look at it step by step. Glucose by the process of glycolysis, which consists of 10 successive reactions, is converted to pyruvate. And note here, glucose is a six carbon containing molecule whereas pyruvate is a three carbon containing molecule. That means one molecule of glucose will lead to the formation of two molecules of pyruvate. If the cell is practicing aerobic respiration, pyruvate is first converted to acetyl coenzyme A and acetyl coenzyme A by the citric acid cycle is converted to carbon dioxide and water in the process it generates high energy electron carriers which are then oxidized by the electron transport chain leading to the formation of ATP. However, if a cell is practicing anaerobic respiration, pyruvate is converted to lactate and this particular phenomena is popularly known as fermentation which happens mostly in vigorously contracting muscle cells and erythrocytes. There is another anaerobic condition where glucose is converted to ethanol and carbon dioxide and this particular process is also called fermentation. However, for our course, this particular pathway is not there. So in our course, we will focus on the aerobic and the anaerobic metabolism of glucose inside the human body. In case of aerobic metabolism, the end result is the formation of carbon dioxide and water, whereas in case of anaerobic metabolism, the end result is the formation of lactic acid. As I told you, I like to divide the glycolytic pathway into two phases. The first phase is called the preparatory phase in which glucose is phosphorylated and converted to fructose which is again phosphorylated and cleaved into two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and in some books they call it the investment phase because this particular phase requires the investment of energy in the form of two ATP molecules. Also, if you look at it here, the 6-carbon containing glucose molecule is converted to 3-carbon containing glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and 3-carbon containing glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, uh, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, sorry, which is then converted to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and each glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules ultimately leads to the formation of one molecule of pyruvate. Since I have two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecules at the end of the glycolytic pathway, I get two molecules of pyruvate. In the second phase, what happens, as I mentioned, two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are converted to pyruvate, but however, in this phase, we generate four ATP molecules and also one molecule of NADH. NAD stands for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. So NADH is protonated NAD. Thus, in the second phase, we have a net gain of two ATP molecules. Why there is a net gain of two ATP molecules? Because in the first phase, I have invested two ATP molecules, whereas in the second phase, I have generated four ATP molecules. So if I subtract two molecules of ATP from four molecules of ATP, the net gain of ATP 
in the process of glycolysis is 2. If someone asks you what is the total number of ATP molecules generated in the process of glycolysis, the answer is 4. What is the net gain of ATP molecules in the glycolytic pathway? The answer is 2. Net gain means that I have to subtract the number of ATP molecules that I have invested in a specific metabolic pathway and in this case it is glycolysis. There are a couple of things that you need to remember here. Glucose is a 6 carbon containing molecule and pyruvate is a 3 carbon containing molecule. So one molecule of glucose will always give rise to two molecules of pyruvate. Now, if I look, want to look at the standing of glycolysis with regards to metabolism of glucose in a cell that is practicing aerobic respiration, I can use a scheme like this. So first, the glucose has to enter the cell through a specific transporter and we will be talking about it in detail in a couple of slides. So glucose enters the cell and in the cytosol, glucose is converted to pyruvate. The two phases are schematically represented here. The investment phase where we convert glucose into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and then we have the ATP generation phase or the second phase where glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is converted to pyruvate and there are specific steps at which we generate ATP. In the investment phase, we use two ATP molecules, whereas in the generation phase, we are producing four ATP molecules. Therefore, the net gain of ATP in glycolysis is equal to two. Pyruvate, if then requires to be metabolized, has to enter the mitochondria, where it is converted to acetyl coenzyme A, and acetyl coenzyme A by the process of Krebs cycle is converted to carbon dioxide and water and you can see here at several steps we generate high energy electron carriers and these high energy electron carriers are then oxidized by the respiratory chain or the electron transport chain to generate further ATP molecules. So, in order for the cell to metabolize pyruvate aerobically, we always require the presence of mitochondria, specifically the mitochondrial enzymes. Also, the process of citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation in the form of the electron transport chain requires the presence of mitochondria or more specifically the mitochondrial enzymes. So if in a cell we do not have mitochondria, pyruvate cannot be converted to carbon dioxide and water and in that situation pyruvate will be converted to lactic acid and in this conversion no ATP will be generated. So under anaerobic conditions or under anaerobic conditions, sorry, we will have ATP being generated only by the process of glycolysis and the net gain of ATP in this case will be 2. The total number of ATP will be 4. I am stressing on this net and total number of ATP molecules produced because of the fact that many a times in the assessment we ask you to calculate either the total number or the net gain of ATP in a specific metabolic pathway. And when you are asked to do so, you should focus on looking at the particular term that you are questioned upon. If it is total number, you just indicate the total number of ATP molecules that are produced. However, if the question asks you to state the net gain of ATP, you should subtract the ATP molecules that have been used up in the particular metabolic pathway and 
then present the number. In case of glycolysis, since we use two ATP molecules in the investment phase, you need to subtract two ATP molecules from the total number of ATP molecules produced, that is 4 minus 2 is equal to 2. Every year I am asked this specific question, how do I study glycolysis? Do I need to memorize all the steps? Do I need to remember all the enzymes? The simple answer to this is, it will be good if you remember the steps and the enzymes because glycolysis is one of the key pathways that, uh, that is uh, examined during an assessment. However, you do not need to memorize the structures except of glucose and pyruvate where you just need to know that glucose consists of six carbons whereas pyruvate consists of three carbons. And because of this fact, one molecule of glucose will lead to the production of two molecules of pyruvate. It will be good if you know some of the enzymes in the pathway and recognize the names of the intermediates and enzymes and we will talk about some of the important steps but in a way if you are able to remember the steps of the process of glycolysis it will be to your benefit not only for the assessments here but also for the future licensing assessments that you will be taking. However, in the process of glycolysis or any metabolic pathway, you need to know the regulatory steps. Also, you should be able to count ATPs and follow what is used, where it is used and when it is used. And this is not only true for glycolysis, but any metabolic pathway that you will study in the second part of the course of biochemistry. Now, this particular slide, I have put it here to show you the summary of the steps. Also, many a times people will give you one of the steps and ask you the classification of the enzyme. You remember from your lecture, the first lecture in enzymes, that there are six different classes of enzymes. So let us take one of the steps here. First step is glucose in the presence of ATP is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. Since I have used one phosphate, ATP is then converted to ADP. ATP, adenosine triphosphate, ADP, adenosine diphosphate. Since I have used one, so three phosphates here. Since I have used one phosphate in phosphorylating glucose, the end result will be glucose 6-phosphate plus adenosine diphosphate which contains two phosphate groups. Now if I look at hexokinase, it's a kinase and if you look at it here, it transfers a phosphoryl group. So based on the activity of the enzyme, you should be able to classify this enzyme according to the six classes of enzymes that you have looked at in the first lecture on enzymes and enzyme kinetics. Now, these are the 10 steps of glycolysis and I believe if you take a printout of this particular slide, keep it in front of you, it will help you to understand the pathway better. But some of the steps we need to look into detail because of their regulatory importance. Now, if I go back to the slide where we talked about the standing of glycolysis with regards to metabolism of glucose in the cell, I pointed out that the first and the most important process is to transfer glucose inside the cell. Now, what happens is whenever a person takes a diet rich in glucose, 
or takes a diet which leads to an increase in the plasma concentration of glucose, insulin is secreted. And this insulin upregulates the transcription of glucose transporter. So by now you already know what transcription is. If the process of transcription goes up, goes up concomitantly, the process of translation will also go up. That means in a given cell, the number of receptors will be upregulated by insulin. That means we will have a greater number of glucose receptors in the cell in the presence of insulin. These particular proteins which help in the transport of glucose are known as glucose transporters abbreviated as GLUT. So in response to high levels of glucose, insulin upregulates the glucose transporters into the cell. That means you have increased number of entry points for glucose into the cell and glucose is then transported inside the cell. Immediately after that, glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate by the catalytic activity of the enzyme hexokinase. Since this is a phosphorylation reaction, therefore this particular process requires ATP. ATP in the process of phosphorylation is converted to ADP. Now, once glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate, it cannot travel outside the cell. So, the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate is important as it traps glucose inside the cell for further metabolism. I repeat again, insulin receptor upregulates the glucose transporters on the cell, that means insulin increases the number of glucose transporters. More precisely, insulin increases the entry point of glucose inside the cell such that glucose can come inside the cell and immediately thereafter it is phosphorylated to glucose 6-phosphate. In the process, one molecule of ATP is used and the formed product or glucose 6-phosphate cannot go outside the cell. So the major event in this particular step or the first step of glycolysis is to trap glucose inside the cell. Let us look at this particular step in a bit of detail. So when we talk about glucose, this is the structure of glucose and I am very sure that you are familiar with this structure by now. So hexokinase in the presence of magnesium converts ATP, uh, in the presence of magnesium and ATP converts glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And if you look at it, this is the sixth carbon, which is phosphorylated. Now, this reaction is irreversible under intracellular conditions. Now, once you have glucose 6-phosphate formed, let us say glucose is entering the cell and an increased number of glucose 6-phosphate molecules are being formed. This glucose 6-phosphate competes for the active site of hexokinase and therefore by a feedback inhibits further conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. What I want to identify here is let us say I have glucose inside the cell after a certain stage I do not require glucose to be converted to glucose 6-phosphate and the process by which this regulation happens first is by active competitive inhibition where glucose 6-phosphate 
competes with glucose to bind to the active site of hexokinase. Additionally, there is also an allosteric interaction of glucose 6-phosphate at an allosteric site in hexokinase which modifies conformational change or which initiates conformational change in the active site of hexokinase as a result of which glucose cannot bind to hexokinase. So this is called product inhibition. That means once I have enough glucose 6-phosphate to initiate glycolysis, this product will inhibit hexokinase to convert glucose to further molecules of glucose 6-phosphate. As I identified for you in the preceding slide, cells strap glucose by phosphorylating it and preventing it, preventing exit on glucose carriers. So what is the significance or physiological relevance of product inhibition of hexokinase? Now product inhibition of hexokinase ensures that cells will not continue to accumulate glucose from the blood if the concentration of glucose 6-phosphate within the cell is ample, which means enough. So if I have enough glucose 6-phosphate inside the cell, the cell will not produce any further glucose 6-phosphate because the present glucose 6-phosphate will competitively as well as allosterically impair the enzymatic activity of hexokinase. Now we talk about we talked about isoenzymes or isozymes and we talked about I mentioned this when we were talking about it the isoenzyme or the isoform for hexokinase that is present in the liver is called glucokinase. So glucokinase and hexokinase they have different primary structure but are responsible for the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. However, if I want to look at the kinetics of glucose, glucokinase and hexokinase, they are significantly different. Glucokinase has a high Km for glucose. If you look at the figure here, the Km for glucokinase is very high. Whereas the Km for hexokinase when glucose is the substrate is very low. That means glucokinase has lower affinity of binding to glucose compared to hexokinase. I told you that insulin upregulates glucose transporters. One of the activities of insulin is that it also activates transcription of the gene that encodes glucokinase enzyme. That means if I have high levels of insulin, they will also, the cells will also have high levels of glucokinase because the process of transcription and translation specific to the glucokinase gene will also be augmented. So why do, you, do we have glucokinase? The thing is, the difference between glucokinase and hexokinase is that glucokinase is not subject to product inhibition. That means it is not inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. So hepatocytes or liver will take up and phosphorylate glucose even when glucose 6-phosphate is high. Let us look at this in a bit more detail. So I have a normal cell. In the normal cell, the glucose enters, is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. When I have enough glucose 6-phosphate, it will inhibit the process of conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And this inhibition 
that glucose 6-phosphate is mediating is for the enzyme hexokinase. I just designate it by H. In the liver cells, however, glucose enters, it's converted to glucose 6-phosphate, but since glucokinase is not inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate, I will keep, the liver cells will keep up uh, taking glucose even if we have high concentrations of glucose 6-phosphate in the liver cells. This ensures quick clearance of glucose from the blood and the excess glucose that is converted to glucose 6-phosphate in the liver is then converted to glycogen which is stored for future use. Whereas in the normal cells, glucose 6-phosphate is used for the generation of ATP. So the key difference between glucokinase and hexokinase is that for glucose, glucokinase has a higher Km whereas hexokinase has a lower Km. And glucokinase is not subject to product inhibition by glucose 6-phosphate whereas hexokinase is subject to product inhibition by glucose 6-phosphate. Why? Now what you have to do for me is to answer the question why does glucokinase have a higher Km for glucose than hexokinase? I repeat, you need to answer the question in the form of a short answer question, why does glucokinase have a higher Km for glucose than hexokinase? So, this is kind of a summary slide showing you the differences between hexokinase and glucokinase. You should remember that both hexokinase and glucokinase are isoenzymes. Hexokinase is expressed in most tissues, whereas glucokinase is expressed predominantly in the liver and the beta cells of the pancreas. Hexokinase has a high affinity or low Km for glucose. Glucokinase has a lower affinity or high Km for glucose. Hexokinase has low capacity or a low Vmax, whereas glucokinase has a high capacity or high Vmax. And this you can see in this particular plot. The expression of hexokinase is not induced by insulin, whereas the expression of glucokinase is induced by insulin. Hexokinase is subject to product inhibition that is, it is inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. Glucokinase is not subject to product inhibition. That means it is not inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate. However, it is inhibited by fructose 6-phosphate, which is the product formed during the glycolytic pathway from glucose 6-phosphate. As you can see here, in this part of the slide. So the second short answer question for you is why do you think glucokinase is inhibited by fructose 6-phosphate but not by glucose 6-phosphate? I repeat the next short answer question that you should answer for me is why glucokinase is not inhibited by glucose 6-phosphate but is inhibited by fructose 6-phosphate. We also need to study the regulation of glucokinase and the regulation of glucokinase is mediated by a specific regulatory protein called glucokinase regulatory protein abbreviated as GKRP. Now I mentioned here in the preceding slide that Fructose 6-phosphate inhibits glucokinase. So what fructose 6-phosphate does, it binds to GKRP. So fructose 6-phosphate binds to GKRP 
that is the glucokinase regulatory protein. On binding of fructose 6 phosphate to GKRP, there is a conformational change. I am abbreviating that as CC. And the fructose 6 phosphate GKRP complex then binds to glucokinase. As a result, glucose molecules cannot bind to glucokinase and there is no production of glucose 6 phosphate. Now, as the cell starts accumulating glucose, glucose competes for binding to the active site of glucokinase with the GKRP fructose 6-phosphate complex. So use the simple kinetics of competitive inhibition to understand this step. As I keep on increasing the substrate, I am able to regain the activity of the enzyme. The same concept is applied here. As I keep on increasing the concentration of glucose, I am able to regain the activity of glucokinase. In the process, the GKRP fructose 6-phosphate complex dissociates from the active site. Glucose binds to the active site of glucokinase and in the process, we get glucose 6-phosphate. So, fructose 6-phosphate binds to GKRP, causing its association to glucokinase in a manner that competes with glucose binding. So, you need to understand this particular step, that is step 2 here, using the simple concepts of competitive inhibition. Now, in our body, we have a separate pathway for fructose metabolism. By now, you already know what fructose is. It's a ketohexose. And in the process of fructose metabolism, we produce fructose 1-phosphate. So fructose 1-phosphate is a non-glycolytic metabolite. Now, when fructose 1-phosphate binds to GKRP, that is the glucokinase regulatory protein, it induces a conformational change, same as fructose 6-phosphate. However, this conformational change in GKRP does not allow it to bind to the active site of glucokinase. So if I want to make this difference with fructose 6-phosphate, when fructose 6-phosphate binds to GKRP, there is a conformational change in GKRP that facilitates the binding of the GKRP fructose 6-phosphate complex to the active site of glucokinase. However, when fructose 1-phosphate binds to GKRP, there is a conformational change in GKRP. However, this conformational change does not allow the GKRP fructose 1-phosphate to bind to the active site of glucokinase. And in that situation, glucose can bind to glucokinase and then glucose 6-phosphate is produced. So, diets containing moderate amounts of fructose are recommended as practical means for diabetics to maintain lower blood glucose levels because if I have increased fructose, I will produce more fructose 1-phosphate if I produce more fructose 1-phosphate, fructose 1-phosphate will bind to GKRP and there will be a conformational change in GKRP such that this particular concept cannot, uh, uh, this particular complex, sorry, cannot bind to the active site of glucokinase and therefore <coughs> the glucokinase active site now can rapidly bind to glucose and glucose will therefore be lowered in blood. The next step and the second regulatory step and the second step is the conversion 
of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate which is catalyzed by the enzyme phosphofructokinase. This is also a phosphorylation reaction. In the process, we use one ATP molecule which is converted to ADP. So, if I look at phosphofructokinase and if I look at the step, the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is the rate limiting step of glycolysis. What is a rate limiting step? I have uploaded a handout onto the LMS about what a rate limiting step is. So for you, it will be essential to define for me what is a rate limiting step or the committed step for a metabolic pathway. Now we come to the regulation of glycolysis. When we come to the regulation of glycolysis, we have to understand that in phosphofructokinase, there are two ATP binding sites. One is called the high affinity site and the other one is called the low affinity or the allosteric site. The high affinity site is the active site. Now, having these two sites in phosphofructokinase, allows us to regulate the activity of the enzyme by varying the levels of ATP inside our body. So what I mentioned, fructokinase is the rate limiting step of glycolytic pathway. Phosphofructokinase is allosterically inhibited by ATP. Now let us look at the situation. Let us take a situation when our body requires to synthesize ATP. That means I need energy. I have low levels of ATP. If I have low levels of ATP, I need to synthesize ATP. So at that state, ATP will bind to the high affinity active site, which will facilitate the conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Now let us take a situation when we have high levels of ATP. That means I do not require to synthesize ATP. So at high levels of ATP concentration, ATP not only binds to the high affinity site, but it will also bind to the allosteric site, which will promote a conformational change in fructose phosphofructokinase, as a result, the active site will not bind any further substrate that is fructose 6-phosphate and ATP and in the process, the process of glycolysis or the process of conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate will be inhibited. At low levels, binding to the active site facilitates conversion of fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. At high levels, binding takes place not only to the active site, but also to the allosteric site, which initiates a conformational change in the active site, lowering the affinity of the enzyme for fructose 6-phosphate. And in the process, we have less product formation and the whole process of glycolysis is inhibited because this particular step is the rate limiting or the committed step of the glycolytic process. We need to understand the regulation of phosphofructokinase. Each year I have some difficulty when explaining this, so I wanted to introduce some slides on allosteric enzymes. Now you already know that what allosteric enzymes are, they have an active site and a regulatory site that controls the conformation of the active site and this regulatory site is known as the allosteric site. Now if I look at any allosteric enzyme or let us say the enzymes that we will encounter in our course, 
they catalyze irreversible reactions and they generally catalyze the rate limiting or the committed step in a particular metabolic pathway. Most of the time they contain more than one polypeptide chain. That means allosteric enzymes will exhibit quaternary structure. They do not follow Michaelis maintain kinetics. I am not going to go into the details of allosteric uh, allosteric uh, um, details of kinetics in relation to allosteric enzymes but what you need to know for your exam is that allosteric enzymes do not give you a hyperbola but give you a sigmoidal curve which is something like this and allosteric enzymes are regulated by allosteric activators or inhibitors we have talked about this in detail when we talked about enzyme overview. Now, if I want to look at the activity of an enzyme in the presence of an activator, I will get plots which are like this. Here, if you can see here, the rate of the reaction is going up because there is an activator present in the medium. However, look at the structure, uh, look at the curves. They are mm, sigmoidal. However, when we add an inhibitor, the rate of the reaction goes down, the curve is still sigmoidal and this shows us that both these curves depict the activity of an allosteric enzyme in the presence of an activator and an inhibitor respectively. So take home message for you, you will ob always observe a sigmoidal curve for allosteric enzymes. So if you are asked what kind of curve will you observe for the activity of phosphofructokinase, you should look at the curve and look at the options and select the curve corresponding to the sigmoidal curve. In textbooks when they talk about allosteric enzymes, they talk about two conformations one is called the tense conformation, the other one is called the relaxed conformation. In some textbooks, they call it the tense state and the relaxed state. The convention is the tense state is inactive because the active site is not exposed, whereas the relaxed state is active because the active site is properly exposed. So, if I want to explain this in the form of in uh, taking phosphofructokinase as, as an example, I will say that increased concentrations of ATP will favor the tense state, whereas decreased concentration of ATP will favor the relaxed state in phosphofructokinase, the explanation for which has been discussed in the preceding slides. I repeat, if I want to express myself using this particular concept of tense and relaxed state with regards to phosphofructokinase, I will indicate that high concentrations of ATP favor the tense state because at high concentrations I do not require to synthesize ATP. Therefore, I require to inhibit phosphofructokinase. So I require the inactive state of the enzyme. Whereas the relaxed conformation favors, is favored by low levels of ATP because when I have low levels of ATP, phosphofructokinase needs to be active such that the whole process of glycolysis is active. And I think based on this, you are now, you should be able to write the short answer questions if you are asked about what happens to phosphofructokinase at high or low levels of ATP. I come back, so I have a high levels of ATP and you can see here the activity of the curve shows that, sorry, 
you can see here that at high levels of ATP the activity of the activity of the enzyme is decreased but you still have a sigmoidal curve which tells you that phosphofructokinase is an allosteric enzyme I mentioned this in the previous slide the tense conformation of phosphofructokinase at high ATP concentration has lower affinity for other substrates such as fructose 6-phosphate and sigmoidal dependence of reaction rate on fructose 6-phosphate is seen. When we have high levels of AMP, AMP meaning adenosine monophosphate or low levels of ATP, then there is extensive then there is ex there, then it requires extensive generation of ATP to um, to cover the deficit and then we have the relaxed state and in the relaxed state you will get higher activity of the enzyme but you still see sigmoidal dependence so high ATP tense conformation low ATP relaxed conformation. In some books, they will say low ATP or high AMP. Now AMP is adenosine monophosphate. That means if I have high levels of AMP, I require, require to convert AMP to ATP. That means I require to generate more ATP. So you should not get confused if a book just mentions that low levels of AMP favors the relaxed conformation. They actually mean the same. That means low levels of ATP or high levels of AMP favor the relaxed conformation of phosphofructokinase such that the process of glycolysis is favored. Please ignore uh, the red line here. So we come to the third regulatory step that is the conver conversion of phosphenol pyruvate to pyruvate and you can see here this particular process requires the enzyme pyruvate kinase. Now pyruvate kinase is regulated specifically within the hepatocytes by high levels of glucose where high levels of glucose lead to the upregulation of a transcription factor known as carbohydrate responsive element binding protein. So what happens is that this particular protein is present in the cytosol. In the presence of glucose or presence of high concentrations of glucose, this particular regulatory protein migrates from the cytosol inside the nucleus. And you all know that the process of transcription happens inside the nucleus. So when carbohydrate response element binding protein reaches the nucleus it increases the transcription of pyruvate kinase and then the process of conversion of phosphenol pyruvate to pyruvate is augmented because that's one of the key steps in the process of glycolysis in other words the upregulation of transcription of pyruvate kinase leads to increased levels of glycolytic reactions inside a cell. Deficiency of pyruvate kinase leads to hemolytic anemia and this particular condition you should remember because this is important. As I mentioned deficiency of pyruvate kinase leads to hemolytic anemia. I will like you to read this section from the book and make some notes but what is more important is for you to tell me why deficiency of pyruvate kinase leads to hemolytic anemia. So this is the third short answer question for you. Why does deficiency of pyruvate kinase lead to hemolytic anemia? Now we can come to specifically the state where we are looking at anaerobic respiration. So we are considering a cell that does not have mitochondria or we are considering a condition 
when we do not have oxygen. Under anaerobic conditions, pyruvate is converted to lactate and in the process NADH is taken up and NAD is produced. So protonated NAD gets deprotonated to NAD plus. So and the process is catalyzed by the enzyme lactate dehydrogenase. We have talked about lactate dehydrogenase and its clinical significance in detail when we talked about isoenzymes. So why do you think pyruvate has to be converted to lactate? The simple answer to this is if you look at this glycolytic pathway and if you focus on this particular step where glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is converted to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate you will see that you are converting NAD plus to NADH. Now if I do not have mitochondria I need to take this NADH and regenerate it back to NAD plus and this is what is happening during the conversion of pyruvate to lactate. NADH is taken up. So if I want to point you out here, the NADH that is produced is taken up and we get NAD+. This NAD plus then goes back into the glycolytic process and therefore the cell can keep on generating ATP although it doesn't have mitochondria. So in an anaerobic condition, or in the need of sudden high amount of ATP, glycolysis is the main source of generation of ATP. And I mentioned that vigorously contracting skeletal muscle will be practicing anaerobic respiration. So by doing or practicing anaerobic respiration, I am able to regenerate NAD such that the muscle can keep on contracting and for this contraction I have adequate amounts of ATP. However, in the process I need to convert pyruvate to lactate and this lactate keeps on, keeps building up inside the muscle cells and that is the reason when someone does vigorous muscular exercise a day or two later he or she feels pain in the muscles due to the buildup of lactic acid. So NAD plus is one of the crucial cofactors required in the process of glycolysis and in order to regenerate NAD plus from reduced NADH, the reaction of conversion of pyruvate to lactate takes place. So what I want to also highlight is that this will only happen in a cell that is practicing anaerobic respiration. Under aerobic respiration, of course, this step is not occurring and pyruvate gets inside the mitochondria for further reactions of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So lactic acid is generally metabolized by liver and kidney by the process of gluconeogenesis and in our course we have to study gluconeogenesis. I talked about a vigorously contracting muscle and in relation to lactate metabolism in the muscle we have to also look at a particular cycle called the Cori cycle. However, these are still early days for now you should know that lactic acid is generally metabolized by liver and kidney by the process of gluconeogenesis. However, in our body another organ is able to metabolize lactate and that specific organ is the heart. So this is a specific figure that I borrowed from, a lit uh, from an article and if you see here 10 to 15 percent of the lactate produced can be metabolized by the heart through the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle and this is unique 
to the heart. So which is the following, which of the following organs metabol metabolizes lactic acid through the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle? The answer is the heart. However, which is the principal site for the metabolism of lactic acid? The answer is liver. When I add citric acid cycle to it, then you should answer heart. If I do not add citric acid cycle to it, you should answer liver. Because in the liver, lactic acid is metabolized by the process of gluconeogenesis, which is different from TCS cycle. This is the balance sheet that you need to uh, remember or you need to at least understand. So glucose to glucose 6-phosphate requires 1 ATP. Fructose to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate requires 1 ATP. The other step that is important which is catalyzed by triosphosphate isomerase is the conversion of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. In this process, I produce two NADH molecules and then I have the conversion of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to 2,3-phosphoglycerate uh, 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 and sorry, uh, I take two molecules of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate and convert it to two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. In the process, I produce two ATP molecules and then at the last step, I take two phosphenol pyruvate molecules, convert it to two pyruvate molecules, I generate two ATP molecules. I have used up two ATP, I have produced four ATP molecules, the net gain is two. I have produced by glycolysis two NADH molecules. Of course, if I keep on metabolizing pyruvate by the process of anaerobic respiration, then this NADH will be regenerated back to NAD. However, under aerobic conditions, NADH is converted or NADH goes into the electron transport chain and in the process, one NADH will give you three ATP molecules. This is important because later for citric acid cycle we have to do a calculation of total number of ATP molecules produced from one molecule of glucose and then this concept has to come into play. However, in anaerobic respiration NADH is converted back to NAD and is not used for ATP generation. Under aerobic concentration, aerobic respiration NADH by the electron transport chain will lead to the production of ATP and one NADH leads to the production of three ATP molecules. So you can, you can note this down as an information that you will require later. Here if I go back to the steps glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, six 6-carbon six to 6-carbon, fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, six 6-carbon six to 6-carbon. Six but if I look at it here, we have already broken down so two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate from one glucose and therefore I get two pyruvates at the end. So this is very very important. 6-carbon glucose gives rise to two 3-carbon pyruvates. Energy yield from glycolysis I have spent quite a bit of time on this, but I will also like you to read this section from the book, especially the part of aerobic glycolysis. So two molecules of NADH are also produced. And if you look at it here, they mention that ongoing aerobic glycolysis, oxidation of most of this NADH by electron transport chain, producing three ATP for each NADH molecule entering the chain. So that's particular information is very very important. I will therefore 
urge you to read this section at least twice from your textbook and make some notes. Now we come to the regulation of glycolysis. Now this particular figure we will again revisit during gluconeogenesis which is actually the reverse of glycolysis but for now focus on this particular part of the slide. We talked about hexokinase. Hexokinase is regulated by product inhibition which is glucose 6-phosphate. We talked a lot about phosphofructokinase. The major regulatory entities are AMP and ATP. We talked about sigmoidal kinetics but you should also know that another metabolite called fructose 2,6-bisphosphate also regulates phosphofructokinase. But the major regulation happens by the variable levels of AMP and ATP. Citrate that is produced in the TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle also inhibits the process of glycolysis by inhibiting phosphofructokinase allosterically. Then we come to the third regulatory step. We talked about the regulatory protein but other regulatory effects of acetyl coenzyme A, ATP are also important. So if I, if I have high concentrations of ATP, pyruvate kinase will be inhibited because I do not need to synthesize ATP. If I have higher concentrations of acetyl coenzyme A, which is the product that is formed by the conversion of, uh, by the catalytic activity of pyruvate dehydrogenase, where pyruvate is converted to acetyl coenzyme A, that product comes and inhibits pyruvate kinase. So if I write it here, pyruvate to acetyl coenzyme A, I'm just writing AC, and this particular step is catalyzed by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, and the acetyl coenzyme A comes back and inhibits pyruvate kinase. There are two other regulatory mechanisms. One that happens by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and one that happens by the amino acid alanine. At this step, I will not discuss this. Probably, this should be discussed by Professor Riyadh when he is talking about integration of metabolism. But for now, I have just focused on the major regulatory mechanisms in play in glycolysis. Also, please try to read this section, Regulation of Phosphofructokinase by Fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. I want you to read this section first and then if you have difficulty in understanding, we can go through this section together. So, answer the following questions and this is important for your short answer question that I mentioned during today's class and the first question is what is the physiological relevance of glucokinase having a higher Km than hexokinase and let us say this has two marks. Higher le high levels of ATP will favor the tense conformation of phosphofructokinase. Is this statement correct? Justify your answer. Answer it for two marks and then we have the third question, in an erythrocyte, beta-carbolin, this is a triosphosphate isomerase inhibitor, is introduced. What is the net gain of ATP from glycolysis in such a cell? You need to calculate the net gain. So you need to look at how many ATP molecules have been used, how many ATP molecules have been produced, and then come up with the answer. So this is like your take home assignment. This particular question is very, very important for your exam. So that brings me to the end of the lecture on glycolysis. I know that for some of you, this will be the first lecture on metabolism. If you have any difficulty in understanding or if you have problems in understanding the regulation of glycolysis or the regulatory steps, please get back to me and we can go over it together
in small study groups. In the next lecture, we go to TCA cycle or the citric acid cycle and then we talk about the electron transport chain. So thank you for listening and I am, I am hoping that you will have some questions after going through the lecture on glycolysis and please write to me if you have questions because glycolysis is one of the fundamental pathways that you need to understand, you need to know in order to grasp the other metabolic pathways that will follow in the biochemistry course. So thank you and have a nice day.